Hi there, welcome to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel. And today we're going to speak about apostolic sending and apostolic seeing. And um, there's, you know, I've got different objectives with, with this video. Um, it might be lengthy, I'll see obviously towards the end. But uh, it's a very important video with regards to the time that we are going in and the kind of challenges we will face. Obviously not in great detail, but I want to touch on certain things that Father has pointed out to me. Um, especially what he causes me to see at this time amongst the brethren, so to speak. And also just to, you know, to prepare us for what is to come. Um, you know, the type of struggles that we will find within the church and how he has provided in various means ways for us to be able to, um, to know what is his will in the time to come. So um, we, we know that also, you know, in various ways, Father speaks in the word of God. He gives us, for instance, in the Old Testament, which is, we know as a shadow, where the New Testament is the substance, the fulfillment of the old. The new is the fulfillment of the old. But also we find types and shadows right through scripture. And even in our own lives, he causes us to open our eyes to be able to see how he speaks to us. So if you know scripture, if you have an understanding of scripture, you will start to see significant things happening in your life and it will have meaning because he's speaking the whole time, just as I did, um, explained with the previous video. And um, I was speaking to somebody um, last week and we were talking about um, just the videos and just the time that we are in. And I find it interesting that Father's focus um, with regards to my videos is very much on uh, the first few years within the tribulation, I would say 2.5 years or so, um, focus with the um, Ephesus, the church of Ephesus and the church of Smyrna, um, because we are reaching that stage where that which was applicable to them will um, increasingly become more applicable to us. So we can already see the types and shadows um, playing out in a real life now at this moment. Um, war and, um, you know, indications of the mark of the beast coming out and, and all those kind of things. Plagues, everything. Uh, we just are starting to see it unfolding, but it's not actually the, the real thing as, as what is to come. So before we go any further, I would just like us to pray um, that Father will just... Take these clay lips and these words and he will anoint it, but also your ears to be able to hear what he is saying to you, you know, just to look past Petra and hear what he is saying, what his spirit is saying. Father, thank you for this opportunity to speak to your children, Father. I can only pray, Father, that those who have ears to hear, that they will hear what your spirit is saying so clearly in this time. You're making it very clear, Father that it is time to go, that it is soon time that you will send out your workers and they need to be prepared. They need to hear what you have to say in this time to them. They need to take it serious, the time that they are in and to seek your face. And so Father, just this teaching amongst many other people that are teaching, Father, your servants that, are you, that you are using are saying very similar things, Father, to get ready, to be prepared, to get your house in order, various things that are being said. And so I pray, Father, anoint these words and anoint their ears to hear what you are personally saying to, her, uh, to them, but also to collectively to the church as a whole, the time that we are in. Just thank you, Father, for everything that you have in how you've prepared me for this message, but also how you will be uh, ministering this message even further after this video is finished. Thank you, Father. We pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Now, in this video, I'll be sharing various dreams of different people that came. One dream came a, a few months ago, but the other dreams came as Father was showing me this information and opening up the word to me with regards to this. So it was very timeless and God sent in my eyes and confirmation as well. 
and um, it serves the purpose as well as to with regards to dreams and visions. Okay, so first thing that we need to understand with regards to apostolic sending and seeing is that apostolic sending, you know, the word apostle means to be sent. Now, in order to be sent, it means you have to go from one place to another one and you have to have a sent message. You come with a message. You are a witness, a messenger, and you are speaking on behalf of God. You are speaking his word. You are speaking what he has shown you and you what you have seen. You know, that apostolic vision and seeing. And I'll be discussing that later on. So you come, you are a sent person with a sent word. Where are you sent to? You are sent to two places. The first one is you are sent into the world. Obviously to proclaim the gospel. And just like John the Baptist, he was declaring to everybody to repent. That means he went to sinners. But also he addressed the Pharisees. That means the church. So the apostolic sending is twofold. It is to the world and it is to the church. Now the church with regards to um, backslidden, lukewarm, compromising with idols, you name it, that kind of church. That is whom, to whom the apostles will be sent to. Now the work of an apostle is that of shepherding. In fact, the fivefold ministry has within it as foundational to shepherd the flock. It's just on a different level. Each one prophetic. When you're a prophet, you also shepherd the flock. You also teach. You also minister. You also exhort. The same, um, but you do it obviously with regards to also with visions and dreams and specific words that the Father gave. But then you get the apostle and he is uh, very much in a shepherding function where he goes from church to church and minister to the congregation as well to the world and ensuring ensuring that uh, 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 that the, the, the congregation is uh, uh, adhering to that which was first spoken. They are sticking and their foundation is sure. They're not uh, uh, getting into false doctrine or anything like that. He is like a rod. The word apostle is linked to the number 12. And number 12 means a rod. And it means uh, uh, to point out, to judge, and to teach, and to disciple. So the work of an apostle is huge. But that's also the work of the fivefold ministry. The same you will find with the teacher where he has to break open the word and he has to feed the flock. Um, evangelist, obviously, to bring in the flock, but also to disciple them, right? So that the flock can stay. They don't wander off. The pastor is to look to the needs of the flock the, uh, um, and to teach as well. You know, and to ensure that the, those who are hungry of it, the widows are looked after, the children are looked after. It speaks of community. It speaks of a, of a father's heart. So the fivefold ministry at, in itself is to be a shepherd, to look after the flock. Okay, so that is the reason why apostolic sending is both to the world and to the church. And you can understand that the time where we're going in, that the church will need to be looked after. They will need to have those whom the Lord God has chosen to oversee and overlook and help and be there. Okay, so it's very important. It's not going to be everybody, you know, gets to do what they want. They still need to stay in the protection of the body because the body needs each other. So I want us to uh, firstly go to Genesis 12. And Genesis 12 is a um, very interesting uh, 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 chapter that the Lord God has given me. In fact, he gave it to me this morning and told me I want you to, to talk about uh, Genesis 12. And it's about Abram that received the first sending. He was sent. He was told to leave all behind. And he will be going um, to wherever the Lord God will, will show him. In other words, he had no clue. It wasn't like he had to get his passport ready and, you know, go to, uh, uh, to the airport and, you know, 
make sh you know book a ticket there was no ticket to book he didn't know what he needed to do all he knew is that he had to take everything and leave so that is walking by faith right and that is what will be required of us in the time to come so before I go to Genesis 12, it's important, and I'm saying it once again, like in all my other videos, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. The prophets is a reference to the Old Testament writings. The apostles is a reference to the teachings that has come from Acts and onwards. Obviously also the gospel, but from Acts and onwards. Those when the apostles started. So the church is built on the word of God, on the whole of the word of God. And the church itself will be a apostolic and prophetic entity in the time to come. In other words, they, the church, will be a standard unto this world. It will be a standard by how they live what they uh, say and what they do in general. It will set a standard. So it will, everything they do will be a message. They will be living epistles. But that doesn't mean every single person within the church, those workers are apostles or each one is a prophet. But they are functioning, they are sent, that it is an apostolic sending of the church into the world. However, Specific apostles have been chosen and will be chosen by him. And it won't necessarily, 99% of the time, it will not be those who, who come on YouTube or any other platform and say, I am an apostle. It will be the housewife or the janitor. It will be the, the, the mother with the young. It will be somebody that has gone through the necessary training in this life to prepare them with the wisdom, the prophetic understanding, and they will receive understanding and um, will be able to shepherd the flock. This is why I explained the whole shepherding function. So it's not necessarily somebody who you would think it would be. It might very well be somebody who we would consider very insignificant. And the reason for that is because God uses weak vessels, not whom we would think would fit the profile. Okay, so that's the first understanding one. It's not everybody's going to be apostles, not everybody's a prophet. Just because you have dreams and visions doesn't mean you're a prophet. Not, that's definitely not the be-all and end-all. Or being able to predict the future is not the be-all and end-all of a prophet. It's much more involved. Okay, so let's go to Genesis 12. Let me just get my Bible here. Uh, okay. And you now have your, um, your pen and paper ready and, and write down what Father is showing you. Pause this video. Make it a study. Uh, you know, determine it in your heart to, to understand now, get wisdom, get understanding, says the word. Okay, Genesis 12, and we're going to read from verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. So here we have Abram, and he's told to leave everything behind. Now we read that and we don't consider the cost. Or maybe we consider it, but we don't really think. What does it mean to leave absolutely everything behind? Remember, we're talking about apostolic sending and this is exactly what will happen. You will be asked to leave everything behind and go. Okay, verse 2. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So there's a promise of protection. As you walk in obedience, you will be protected. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. 
So the word, it's a sent word. He must first be sent. So first the Lord speaks. He doesn't go in his own womb. He doesn't go because there is a need. He doesn't go because somebody asked him to. He goes because the Lord God had spoken to him. Okay. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. So there were people that, that came with them as well. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Now please understand, Canaan is, when you hear the word Canaan, two things must come to your attention. It's the land of milk and honey, provision, right? But it's also the land of giants. So, it's warfare. So understand this apostolic sending takes you to a place of great revelation and provision, milk and honey, but it also takes you to the place of giants, of warfare. This is what will take place. Verse 6, And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sichem, unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was then in the land. So Sichem means shoulder or burden. And More, so he came to More, and that means teacher. So this is what they will do. They will carry the burden of the different uh, churches and flock. They will carry that burden upon them and they will teach. They will help build the church. This is also the function of an apostle is they are tent makers like Paul. They establish different churches in different areas. Then they make sure that there's a shepherd to stay behind with that flock. And they make sure that the teaching is correct. Then once that is finished, their job there is done. Then they are being sent again. So they might stay there a year, two years, three years. But then they have to leave again as the word comes to go again. There's always a leaving and a dying that takes place because they build relationship with these people. So then they have to leave and go to another place to do exactly that once the Lord God has spoken. Okay, so this is a very good example of apostolic sending. Verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. Okay, And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So, he is building an altar. An altar has with on it a sacrifice. So the leaving will be a sacrifice. When Abram left, he had to leave his father's house and his kindred. And he had to leave the land. Everything about it, he had to leave. Okay, It's not necessarily going to be easy. In fact, most of the time it won't be easy. So it was a sacrifice. So Abram made an altar. He brought a sacrifice. Verse 8. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. See, there's the tent. Having Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed going on still towards the south. Okay. So there you have a very clear description of apostolic sending and what it means. Now the interesting part with uh, uh, Abram just after that, you can read it on, on your own time, um, is that just after that, uh, Zipporah, uh, not Zipporah, Zipporah was Moses' wife, uh, uh, Sarah. Sarah was very beautiful. And I think Zipporah was also very beautiful. And Sarah, uh, 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 Abram, was going to Egypt, which represents the world. Remember, I said the apostolic sending is being sent into the world as well. So he's going to Egypt, and he knows Sarah is beautiful, and he will probably be killed because they would want Sarah. And uh, the officers or the men of Pharaoh saw Sarah and told uh, Pharaoh about this beautiful woman. And it's the whole story of how... Uh, uh, Pharaoh realized that this was actually Abram's wife and he sent her away and was upset about it. And the old, the issue or the, 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 
the focus here is how Abram, this great man of faith, leaves everything behind and now he has to go into Egypt and he fears man. So this is obviously the first thing that will face us, is the fear of man. We might now say we don't have any fear of man, but then it's another story. When those of your own household or those in power have the power to kill you and to throw you into prison or to kill your family or do horrible things to your children or what the case may be, then the fear of man will be very great. So this is uh, for our understanding that the fear of man, those are in great power. Pharaoh was seen almost as a god. Um, so those in great power that we will stand before them and we cannot fear man. This is why Father had me write or do the devotional called about the futility of man. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is that an apostle is chosen. So even though the church is an apostolic and prophetic entity, there are certain people that the Lord specifically through centuries have chosen for a specific purpose. If you look at uh, uh, um, Acts, was it Acts 9? Acts 9, I think. It talks about, yes, about Saul that became Paul, right? And he was blind for three days and he had to completely depend on somebody else to bring him to a place of safety. And um, then later on he was ministered to. And Paul was chosen. He was chosen. But the church is also an apostolic and prophetic entity. And for that, we can just simply go to Acts 15, verse 14. And it says there, Simeon have declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. That would be the church, right? To take out of them a people for his name. So he is taking out of the world. He's got um, uh, the Jews and then he's got the Gentiles. And he's chosen from out of them people whom he will send. Okay, so you have a group, and without in that group, he also chooses those specific individuals that he will send out. So this doesn't mean because you now know that you are not an apostle or you are not a prophet or any of these things that I mentioned. That doesn't mean anything of what I'm saying is not applicable to you. Because the church as a whole is being sent as an apostolic and prophetic entity. Okay, so please listen to this. So in Acts 9 verse 15, it talks about Paul being chosen. Um, and it, this was said to Cornelius because he had to go to, uh, to Paul to go and pray for him that he may receive his sight. Now, it's interesting that sight is, for me, I'm looking at it a prophetic perspective. It's now Paul is going to look on life and things differently. He will have apostolic seeing. He will see things the way God sees. He will speak the way, uh, the sp his speaking will be God's speaking. His hearing will be God's hearing. His seeing will be God's seeing. And in order to get to that place, something has to happen with that person in preparation. Just because you are chosen doesn't mean you are already prepared. Okay, so that's the whole purpose of life, is to prepare us. Okay, so the word chosen means it's from G1589 in the Strong's Concordance. And it means the act of picking out. And it comes from G1586 as well. And it means choosing one for an office of God, choosing whom he judged fit to receive his favors and separated from the rest of mankind to peculiarly his own and to be attended continually by his gracious oversight. So this is somebody chosen. Now examples of that would be uh, Jeremiah 1, where um, the Lord God tells Jeremiah that while before he was formed in the womb, he was already chosen. So that cannot be said of everybody. We would love to take that little <laughs> and say, oh, before you were formed, I already chose you. No, that's, that's a prophetic call on Jeremiah's life. Before he was even born, God decided, I already know what's going to happen in his life. This is the person I am choosing for this purpose. So you can bet everything about Jeremiah's life before he actually first prophesied or made the any, before he received his call, he was prepared to be that. Okay. 
So another example is David. David was anointed. He was, there could only be one David. Okay. Same with Samuel. Samuel heard the call when he was with Eli. Um, Paul, it's very clear that Paul was uh, were called. Nehemiah or Nehemiah, ne 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 how do you say it? Nehemiah. I always say Nehemiah. But anyway, um, he, he was called to, uh, 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 to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So there was only going to be one person that's going to do that. Okay. Um, and there's different examples that we can get into it. Now, the, the, the flip side of that is those that are called out, I would say maybe the evil side, is Pharaoh. That in Romans 11, it talks about, uh, Paul talks about how the Lord God chose Israel, the Jews. He chose them, okay? And he says, the Lord God says, I will choose whom I will choose. So that's not a general term, I'm choosing everybody. He's very specific about his choosing. But then he, he talks about Pharaoh, how he chose Pharaoh. He was specifically choosing Pharaoh. Um, Saul, King Saul, um, he was chosen to be the king. They wanted a king, and the Lord showed Samuel, this is the king I've chosen for them. Because they wanted a king. They didn't want him, the Lord God, to rule over them. And then we have Judas, obviously. You know, there was Judas. They, all of these people had a choice. They could follow it or not. Just like the, the good side, the righteous side, you know, David and Samuel and Jeremiah, they could all choose to follow or not. Uh, they were chosen, but it was up to them whether they were going to do it or not. We all have a choice in the end. We're not robots. Okay. So, obviously, and then the Antichrist, he's already chosen as well for that specific purpose. So, when it comes to this choosing, there's a specific purpose that these people are to be to fulfill. The same with those who will be the apostles in the time to come. Okay. Um, I think what a, a good example that I thought about, um, well, I suppose the Lord gave it to me, is when you get a model train that or uh, aeroplane that you have to build up, you get all the parts at, in a bag, but it's not a plane yet. All the parts are there, but somebody has to put it together in order to make it what it's meant to be. Right? And so he has provided all things already for us to be what we need to be. But somebody needs to put it together. And that's the sanctification process. That's the testing process. So, you know, Paul was sent for three years. Uh, was it three or four years? I can't remember. Where he was sent into the wilderness of Arabia. And there he had to go through his sanctification process. He had a lot of knowledge of the word, but he himself had to be prepared because what was told to Cornelius is this man will suffer much for the gospel's sake. So even though Paul, amazing things happened through his life, um, he was going to suffer much um, and he had to be prepared to endure it. So it was for three years that he was sent into the wilderness to be tested. And like my previous videos, I mentioned that the seal period is likened unto the wilderness period and Jacob's trouble is likened unto Canaan. But Canaan is also our heavenly, you know, being uh, uh, coming into heaven and receiving uh, 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 rest because that's what Canaan stands for, is to enter into his rest. So the wilderness period is the testing. So during the the tribulation, our faith and our love will be tested. Those are the two things that will be tested and tried. Our faith and our love. And faith worketh by love. So either one of that has a problem, it's the house will fall. Because that's the foundation of which we live by and move by. Is our faith in Christ. Okay. Okay. So let's go to Galatians 1 and we're going to read just 8 verses from 11 to 18 where Paul talks about this wilderness experience um, and what he's learned. Verse 11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. He's saying, I didn't get this from anybody. I was in the wilderness. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Yeshua came to him and explained it to him and opened the word to him, the spirit. 
for you have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion. You've known how I've been uh, when I was a Pharisee. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals of my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, when the time came, who separated me from my mother's womb, I was chosen, and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen immediately. I conferred not with flesh and blood. So if you go back to my devotional called The Futility of Man, I'm talking about how he is going to require of us not to go to any textbook, not to have all your scriptures ready or anything like that. But he promised us that we, the Spirit, will give us unction and in that moment we will know what to speak. So here he is referring to that as well, that he doesn't go to man, he doesn't lean on the arm of the flesh, but that the Spirit reveals things and that's how he preached. Okay. Verse 17, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia. I went into the wilderness. I was taught by God and returned again into, unto Damascus. Verse 18, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Okay. So another test that Paul went through is in Acts 16, and this is when he, uh, uh, he, Paul and Silas were preaching on the streets, and they were taken into custody, and they were then thrown into a dungeon. And one can imagine that if you were thrown into a dungeon, that you would be in despair. The dungeons were dungeons, it reeked of different smells, rats, excrement, uh, you can just imagine the death, the spirit of death there and sickness and all that. And there they are. And everything Paul has already experienced has prepared him for this as well. And then they broke up, broke out in a song of worship and worship God and the prison doors opened. So they were sent to the dungeon. They weren't a victim of whoever did what to them. They were sent because what happened? The God and his whole family were saved because of that. So God had a purpose with Paul and Silence, Silas to be sent to the dungeon. Okay. So I mentioned previously that um, the, the bride has her virgins. That is, uh, if you go to my video called The Queen of the South, you will have a very clear explanation about who she is and what will be required. But I will just quickly say, yeah, it's, re it's referred to or it's, it, I discuss out of Psalm 45, the Queen of the South. <coughs> and I explain that. So the Queen of the South basically is the bride, the worker bride with her virgins. Okay, those whom uh, 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 she's the queen where the virgins are the, the, the bridal company with her. They follow her. And just like Yeshua, the lamb has virgins following him, the bride has virgins following her. Okay, I explain everything in that video. It will take too long to explain it here. But Yeshua, the, the disciples came to Yeshua and asked him about the end time and what will happen. And he said to them that the queen of the south will, um, will rise up with him. So let's read that. That's in Luke 11 verse 31 and 32. And listen to what the worker bride will be doing, remembering that the church is an apostolic and prophetic entity. Okay, verse 31. The queen of the south shall ri rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts. Remember uh, Acts 15 where it says he has taken out of the Gentiles. He's taken. So she will. Let's read it again. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. 
for she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold a greater than Solomon is here so Yeshua was talking about himself saying she will rise up with him okay verse 32 the men of Nineveh shall rise up in thy judgment with this generation Nineveh is referring to Arabia and the Jordan so it's talking about Gentiles rising up okay once again Acts 15 they will rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Now Jonah was a prophet saying, repent. So here once again, rising up in judgment, apostolic function, and as Jonah, prophetic function, behold a greater than Jonas is here. Okay, this, okay, that's something else. So, the church is going to rise up, or the worker bride, as the queen of the south, rises up with her virgins, with those that she has prepared, that will be uh, functioning under her. So you can see that almost as the different churches that the apostles and the, those in the fivefold ministry will minister to. Okay, the different churches will be like the, the, the virgins that follow her. Okay. So let's go to Acts 17, where we read of Paul, where he was sent out. Um, and let's read from verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. <laughs> Clearly this is Greece. Where was a synagogue of the Jews. Okay, listen to this verse. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. So Paul was like laser focus. Where's the first synagogue? It's like when he came into a town, where's the first synagogue that I can just go to that church? Okay. Verse 3. So he's reasoning with them. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews which believed not. Okay, so he was talking to the Greeks and the Jews. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy. This was the focus of uh, Sister Donna's dreams that she wanted me to interpret with the gifts and the dreams and visions and that the church will be moved with envy. Okay, I'll expound on that. Took unto them certain lewd fellows, those of a baser sort, and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar. The whole city is against Paul. And assaulted the house of Jason. Okay, and sought to bring them out to the people. So Paul was staying at Jason's house. And then they say, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These have turned the world upside down and come here unto also. So Paul was staying at Jason's house. And, he, and because they were looking after the apostles, certain people were, were uh, uh, opening their houses for them. And because they were looking after them, they too were being attacked. Okay, so this envy is quite cruel. Proverbs 27 verse 4 tells us, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. But who is able to stand before envy? If you look up the word envy and you write in, say you write in Google or wherever you go, duck, duck, go, and you write, type in envy scriptures, you will see that most of them will talk about how it was envy that caused Christ to be crucified. That is the state of envy. So it's important that we deal with envy within the church. Now why is this important? Because Father has guided me, and you will see the types and shadows, when I spoke in my video to John's and a Jezebel, that the Jezebel spirit, which is an antichrist spirit, will rise up, in this time has already risen up but will increase and she works on she's a religious spirit where will you find a religious spirit within the church 
but she's an envious spirit because an envious spirit is a murderous spirit. This is why it says that envy moved them to, to, to crucify Christ. So it's a murderous spirit that will rise up within the church. I cannot ex express more how important it is that we deal with envy. For the sake of the church, for the sake of the apostles, for the sake of the brethren, for the sake of the body, you know. So, and envy is not just jealousy. It's, it's much worse than jealousy. It's a murderous spirit, just like Jezebel was. And who did Jezebel persecute? The prophets. Okay. So, Yeshua told us something interesting. He said, this is how they will know that you are my disciples, when you love one another. Now, it, the word says that love will grow cold during this time. So within the church, this is what we will have to be alert of, of envy. Because there will be great signs and wonders, and there will be dreams and visions, and those who do not have will be envious. And those who do have might even envy more, to want more, right? So, it, it, and if we do not protect the church, this type of spirit will grow and will divide the church. And it will become murderous. Okay. So. This love. Will be so in contrast. With the gen general idea. Of what we will see in the church. That when we love one another. They will know we are his disciples. That's the difference between a church and a disciple. Yeshua said. Unless you are willing to leave mother, father, brother, sister. Friend and even hate your own life. You are not worthy to be my disciple. Not my child, my disciple. So you get the church full of children of God, but not full of disciples, because they have not left everything like Abram. Right? They still have something to leave. Um, so these are the disciples. When you love one another, when, you're, when you are one as my body is one, because you are my body. When they see that you are one with me, because you are one with one another. The one is the other. To be one with him is to be one with one another. That is how important it is that we protect the body in the time to come. Because the enemy's focus will not, he's got already the world in his hand. His focus is to persecute the saints. His focus is the church to kill. That antichrist spirit, that murderous spirit will come after the church like never before. And we have to, it, he divides them within. He works within the hearts of man on the inside to break it up. Okay. So the word says, a house divided cannot stand. That's what Yeshua told us. A house divided cannot stand. That's the focus of the enemy. So I want to talk to you about a dream uh, at this time when Father was showing me all this of a friend that I, her name is Maya and she gets uh, profound dreams. I love her dreams um, and she often comes to me and asks for interpretation. And so this came clearly at a very good time exactly when Father was talking to me about this. And this is a dream and I will give you the interpretation after that as well. Um Let's call, what shall we call this dream? It's got so much in it. Let's call it envy. My whole entire family was playing hide and seek inside my childhood home growing up. I ran to the room under the stairs and put myself into a giant gift bag and used tissue paper to help cover me. And then I ran to the Christmas tree and hid. I watched a man walk over to me and find me and knew he was a bad guy, so I ran from him. The next scene, I was sitting with Courtney, my older sister, on a couch, and she was drinking wine and having a good time, telling stories with my family. I sat next to her, all out of breath, and said, I was just hiding from this man. I hid under this Christmas tree as a gift. The next scene, I'm on an escalator, only it's flat, so it's more like a conveyor belt. The conveyor belt leads to a very archaic attachment to my childhood home. And it's this demented children's hospital. Totally burnt to a crisp and so dusty and dirty from over the years of neglect. 
the conveyor belt was leading us on almost like a tour of the hospital from the outside looking in because the whole wall was off the hospital like you could see into it the way you can a dollhouse so she's standing on this conveyor belt and she's seeing it's moving and she's seeing this old building that's burned down demented children's hospital and she's looking in it doesn't have a wall she can look in the thing that was striking was that all the children's toys were hanging off the ceiling as if it was the floor. Then the conveyor belt started to turn into it and was starting to lead into the children's hospital. And I started saying, no, 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 I'm not going in there. And I turned around and started out the way I'd come. There were a few other people with me on the conveyor belt too, but they stayed. It scared me because this place was like an abandoned, burnt, demented, haunted children's hospital and I didn't want to go in. So this is the interpretation of this dream. This dream is divided into three parts. The hide and seek, the sitting on the couch with the sister and the demented children's hospital. All three very significant. Playing hide and seek is a children's activity whilst drinking wine is reserved for adults. Now, Maya's childhood home, where she has grown up, represents the church, the place where we are his children and grow in maturity. Maya, hiding in the room under the stairs, not wanting to be seen, is pointing to a humble disposition. The chairs would, the chairs, the steps would lead upwards, but she is choosing to hide under the room, under the stairs. She's wrapping herself up as a gift with tissue paper and still not wanting to be seen. Those who are used by the Lord through the gifts of the Spirit need to have a humble disposition. This is what it means. Hiding under the Christmas tree is pointing to where the gifts come from. Not a Christmas tree, but from Him who is the Father of lights, from where every perfect and good gift comes from. That's written in James 1, 17. Every good gift and perfect gift comes from, the, from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness and neither shadow of turning. The church is also told to follow after gifts in Scripture in 1 Corinthians 14. Follow after charity, love, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that he, I rather that he may prophesy. So the word to follow after means to seek it. So the people were playing in her family, the children, everybody were playing hide and seek. And she said gift hiding. So they seeking gifts. So this is twofold, seeking gifts versus seeking him. Obviously seeking him comes first, the gifts comes from him. But when we seek gifts and not him, that's when envy happens. Okay. However, this bad man, bad man finds her represents those who come after those who are being used by the Spirit with their gifts due to envy. As will be the case of the time we are going in, that with the outpouring of the Spirit manifests itself through signs and wonders, dreams and visions. So this is going to happen a lot, dreams and visions, signs and wonders. People will be envious. Maya gets it right to get away from this bad man and sits out of breath next to her older sister, who is drinking wine and talking about good times with the family. Her sister's name is Courtney, which points to being courted, right? She represents those who have served the Lord for a long time. She's the older sister, being the older sister who now thinks they have this discernment thing in the bag, right? This bad man is running around in the same house, but they're not seeing it. They're drinking wine, whereas Maya is being persecuted. Because she's operating and being led by the Spirit. Those who sit on the couch thinking they are secure are no threat to the enemy. They can just go on with what they are doing. Sitting on the couch. They've got the Spirit, which is what the wine represents. They've got the Holy Spirit. They've been doing this for a long time. They've been in church for so long. They know, man, nobody can fool them. They're sitting on the couch. However, those who do operate under the guidance of the Spirit will be taken to places apostles sent out. Often these places will not be what we would necessarily like. It would be an apostolic sending, meaning ascending with a purpose or a word. 
Now, this reminded me of Donna's dream. Now, I did a dream interpretation of Donna called the Black Dog. And it was about her being in a house and everybody thinking this dog is amazing and this dog started attacking her. Um, and eventually it was this dog spirit trying to uh, uh, kill her or uh, lifted her up. And then all of a sudden she was on the street facing a three-story building and every building with, and she didn't want to go in the building because she could hear the people screaming and what they were doing. And she, just like Maya, said, no, I do not want to go into that building. And that building represents the church. And it had three levels because every level, the higher you go up, the greater the warfare was. So please go back to that uh, 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 dream. I will put it in the description box as well so that you can easily go to that dream as well. Um, so it's important that we understand this is what we will face. So this is the same. Donna, Donna saw a church that she didn't want to go in. Maya saw also a church. That is what the, 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 the house stands for that is burned down. So let's go on to that. Maya now finds herself on a conveyor belt with others, having the ability to see what is going on in another house. Apostolic seeing. This other house, a demented and burned down dirty house, is representing the church in a stagnating and declining state. She and the others are seeing through the wall, which means a portal or a door in the spirit, exactly what the true state is. For others, it might look like an older sister sitting on a couch, having a good time, not alert, but having a fun time in the church. But they see the true state. It's actually a children's hospital and it is sick. The church itself is meant to be a hospital. Yeshua said the following in Luke 5. And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. So that is what the church is. It's a hospital. But she is seeing this hospital, this demented children's hospital, and it's broken down, it's burned down, it's filthy, and it's old. Then she sees the toys hanging from the ceiling. The reason for this is twofold. The toys represent spiritual gifts, as toys are gifts unto children. For they are hanging from the ceiling because they come from above. However, hanging there speaks of the fact that they have not been played with. Otherwise, they would have been on the floor. And this is part of the reason for the state of the church, who is a demented children's home, unkept, dirty and even burnt down. It is useless. The gifts of the Spirit are for the purpose of ministering to the body. And if they do not seek these gifts, the state of the church will decline. Instead, these very people envy those who do not operate in them. There's many people that do not even desire gifts. It's true. I mean, you can almost not think that that's the case. But there are people who do not even desire gifts. But Paul tells us, desire gifts, because gifts are there to minister to the body. It's there to protect us. It comes from our Father. Our Father wants to give us these gifts, but we need to ask Him. And we need to ask the gift He wants to give us, right? Not just any gift. He has a purpose with it. Maya does not want to go into the church which the conveyor belt is taking her to. The conveyor belt is something you stand still on and move. She and the others with her represent watchmen on the wall, looking through the wall of the church. The state of the church is so bad that she does not want to enter. However, apostolic sending requires of us to be led by the Spirit, the conveyor belt, and be willing to go into those very churches in order to minister to his sick children. This is much like Donna's dream, like I said. Same message. Persecution within the church, the black dog, due to envy, and in this case with Maya, the bad man, then being sent to a sick house where spiritual warfare has to take place and being able to see the true state of the church. So about two days before Father started opening this particular word to me, he gave me a dream wherein he told me that where I was presently uh, uh, very involved on a forum and ministering to people and building relationships 4.5 years long, um, that's how long I was there, that he gave me a dream and told me that I need to move. He wants me to move. So I'm 
I practice what I preach. So this comes out of having to have done that, which was net, most definitely not an easy move for me. And the dream that he gave me was that I told my husband that I want, we are staying on a farm. And I can see the farmland all around me. It's a wheat farm. And it talks about the harvest field. And I'm telling him that I want to move all my equipment, all my artwork and everything, basically my office. I want to move it from our house to this other house on the same uh, land. And the other house is broken down. It's not burnt, but it's broken down. It's got cobwebs and it's dirty. And as I, somebody else is walking with me, which is the type and shadow of the Holy Spirit, and we are going into this house and I find two people washing dishes. And they are cleaning these dishes and I don't know who they are, but I just greet them and then I take this man and we look for a, a place where I can put all my office equipment. And then afterwards, I wanted to find my dog, Chloe, because Chloe is very dirty. Chloe's uh, uh, fur is matted. She's a small little German spitz, very cute and little go-getter and she's dirty and we need to deal with her. So the interpretation of the dream is that Chloe represents um, the church that needs sanctification still in this time to come. But he was telling me that he wants me to move. It's an apostolic sending. He's sending me somewhere else. Just like Abram, he has not told me where he's taking me. But there, I've left everything and I'm willing to go. I'll follow him. And the word that he gave me is what he told Peter. Remember, my name is Petra. comes from Peter. Where he asked Peter... Um, when he was preparing the fish and the bread on the shore, on the beach, he was telling him, uh, asking him, Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter, do you love me more than all these that I've, I've given you in all these years? Will you, leave, or will you leave them behind to follow me and feed my sheep? And my answer was yes. So in the same case, he's saying, he's taking me to another place. It will not look nice. It will look burnt down. People will... It's a sick, demented children's home. I need to minister to my flock. There's other people. They have green pastures where you were busy with. They've been fed. They are full. They, they have so much that they can feast on. But there are others. Other flock. Other sheep. That need to receive green pastures. And they need my word. And you need to go to them. I'm sending you. See, it's about Father's heart. It's about the great chief shepherd that loves his sheep, that sees the demented children homes, literally and figuratively, that sees the church broken down, that is sending us, and we cannot hold on to what was. We have to go where he sends us. Okay. So Father guided me to... Um, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10 to 13. Paul speaks to them and he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. Remember, I talk about the enemy wants to bring division within the church and with envy as well. But that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the household of Chloe, <laughs> that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified of, for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So what you find here is uh, almost... Uh, 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 you see the type and shadow in Abram when he left. Um, Abram and Lot came to a part where they had to uh, uh, choose land, which, which part they will go to. And we know Lot chose Sodom and Gomorrah, facing the land facing Sodom and Gomorrah. But before that, the reason why they had to choose to do that, because they were so prosperous, they had so much cattle, they had so much, that because of the land, the, the land couldn't, uh, handle the uh, all the cattle it was too much land was grass was eaten up and so obviously the ecosystem suffered under it it's amazing god's wisdom 
And so they had to part. But the uh, word says the herdsmen were uh, uh, amongst each other and they were, were quarreling about whose land is land. In the same way, we find the church here and they're quarreling. And I'm from Apollos, no, I'm, I'm Paul, I'm from Peter, you know, Cephas. So there's this quarreling amongst each other, amongst the herd. <laughs> so we see the same type in shadow. And with Father saying to me, you know, the household of Chloe, I'm sending you to the household of Chloe, where, where you need to minister to them. Okay, so in the same way, he's going to do and continue to do with us wherever we go. So they speak of immature children, sick children that needs father, fathers and mothers within the church. And fathers and mothers have nothing to do with how long you've been serving the Lord. It has all the fact that you're a mother and a father it has everything to do with maturity in the spirit and the sanctification process and what you've gone through. So the enemy's focus is envy and division in the time to come. And it should be our understanding that this is exactly what will happen. You can just imagine, um, you know, a statement that I make often is, it takes tribulation for the true church to stand up. That is a double-sided, or let's say one side of the coin is, the true church under pressure will rise in faith. And will not fall. She will be powerful. She will be focused. And she will be a force to be reckoned with. But the flip side of that. The other side of the coin is. The true church. The one that is dilapidated. Demented. Broken down. No power. It's like a ghost house. Without the Holy Spirit so to speak. That true church will also be shown. Will also stand up. And we will know them by their fruit. Okay, so as I was doing this, Father, uh, I went into my into YouTube and the first video I saw was a short clip and I thought, once again, his timing's perfect in everything he does. It was, I just read about the sheep challenging the shepherd or the shepherd dog and it showed this video of this sheep, very obstinate, now standing aggressively wanting to attack this sheep dog. And this sheepdog has the shepherd, the chief shepherd behind him, ordering him to, you know, nip here and nip there and, and, you know, get the sheep in order, get in line. And I thought, isn't that just amazing? Because what I am finding now is that because of this woke generation, because of everybody now all of a sudden realizing of all the deception um, of those are, who are in authority, whether it's in government or whether in church, that, that the sheep is starting to become uh, aggressive, arrogant, prideful, because they now know the truth. Deception has now been revealed. They have seen what is happening within the church and they trust no one. And they are unwilling to submit to authority. This is part of the division that will happen in the time to come. And yet the enemy knows it. So you can understand how the enemy uses the good, finding out the truth, in order to ensure that the sheep will start to rebel against authority. And that's exactly what we need to govern against. That means that we are not to follow blindly. But as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, you follow somebody that's in authority by the degree that you see them following Christ. And that's not necessarily always just because you know the truth. Because sometimes, and Father is so wise, He will even cause somebody who you look up to, to disappoint you. To disappoint you. And you could think, you know, He's really in the wrong with what he says. I don't agree with what he's saying. But your reaction is showing your true state. The fact that you are not willing to submit to what he says, even if he's wrong. And I'm not talking about doctrinal truth or salvation truth. I'm talking about a different view on things. And just because you react the way you are reacting, you are missing the point of the, the rebellion in your own heart. You're not willing to submit to authority, which could actually save you from further deception. Humility is going to be a big 
thing in the time to come because of how Father will be using us. And if that humility is not there, if you think you know all the answers or because you have received dreams and visions or because you have received this word from Father or this has been opened up to you and you never consider the fact that you can actually be wrong and you stand up against authority and you cause other sheep to follow you, woe to you. Woe to you when you cause other sheep to follow you because of your arrogance, because you're not willing to submit to authority first so that he can raise you up. You see, the very test of your knowledge and what he has shown you, the test in it is how much are you willing to submit in humility before he can use you, not to cause everything to be a display of how much you know. Because the moment we think we know something, we want to go everywhere and proclaim it and not wait on him for him to test our character first before we speak. We need to humble ourselves. We need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for those who are in the fivefold ministry. We need to pray for those who have given us to speak into our lives. We need to pray for them. We need to love them. It doesn't mean we cannot speak to them when we don't agree. It means that we have to be willing to submit if they don't agree. And we don't move because we don't agree. We move like Abram when God has spoken. Not because you don't agree. How do you know you being there still requires you to minister to other sheep? But because you got angry with your leader or those who teach, you are not in agreement with them. Now you move. You are in the flesh and out of the spirit. Let those who have ears to hear, hear what the spirit is saying. Because this is about the division the enemy wants to cause in the time to come. 1 Peter 5 is appropriate in this. Verse 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort who am also an elder. Okay, so Peter is an apostle. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So have the right attitude to look over the flock and feed them with humility. Be willing to love them and suffer whatever comes your way. Verse 3, neither is being lords over God's heritage, okay, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, because you're shepherds, but when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you, be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. All of you, the elders and the younger, be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, everything that you don't agree with, cast it upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober. Be, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who have called us unto eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, Make you perfect after you've suffered this being looked upon as wrong. After you have suffered of being willing to shut your mouth instead of wanting to prove your leader wrong. After you've suffered that test. Make you perfect, establish, strengthen and settle you. Then you can speak. So as Father was talking to me about um, Paul that went out to... Uh, uh, Athens and, and the different places where he went to the synagogue and spoke. Um, 
my friend Simone, just after I wrote everything down, my journal, my friend Simone, uh, in the morning we talk to each other and we send each other's messages and greeting each other every morning. And she said that she had a dream of me and she just wants to send me this dream. So this is her dream and I'll give you the interpretation and you will just see how clearly Father is confirming that this is the time we are in. You see, this is the purpose of visions and dreams. It's to in the time to come. It is to notify us and show us when it is time to move. You know, it's yes, he can do it through scripture, but he will do it through dreams and visions. Paul had exactly the same. He was told in a vision that he was not to that he was to, to, to go to Macedonia and not to Jerusalem. He was told on the uh, 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 on a ship to go to Italy. Or no, he was told on a ship that they would not be hurt and that they would go to Italy. Dreams and visions. Uh, Peter was sitting on the roof. Or no, it wasn't Peter who was sitting on the roof. Not Cornelius. I can't remember where. Or it was Peter that, that he saw the, the linen cloth and the unclean animals. And then he was told that he the Gentiles are also open to, to, um, to the gospel. So visions and dreams are for, to serving the body. So this is another dream you should take note of. Don't ignore dreams. Write them down. Please note, write your dreams down. So this is Simone's dream. She dreamed that I was sending her and Chantal, my other friend, an audio message about how I am moving to the city this weekend. So this is just after the dream Father gave me with regards to moving my ministry. So I'm moving to the city. I was telling them how difficult it will be for me as I would never be able to have the time of peace and quiet I was used to now having to move to the city. I would not be able to play with my dog and do things in my own time. I would be too busy. So then she then could see me standing in the city. So Paul was sent to the city. Far, uh, Abram was sent to Far or to Egypt, which is a type and shadow of the world or the city. Okay. I was dressed in a salmon color of a suit, flowers all over it, and had high heels on, my, on with my briefcase. I'm on official business. I'm standing in my office. I looked to her like a typical businesswoman of New York, very official. The next moment, she saw my daughter taking a video of me with her cell phone standing at a distance from me. My daughter was completely focused on me with her cell phone. She noticed that this city was a very Mediterranean looking with old buildings, but yet had a modern feel to it. The next moment I walked around a corner and she saw my daughter turn her focus away from me to a charging bull. This bull was very thin and angry, heading straight to my daughter. Simone shouted that she should get away, but noticed that my daughter was completely calm. The next moment, Simone saw the video zooming out again and noticed that between my daughter and I was a wired fence. Now, Simone, in describing the dream to me, called it a Uchis draad. So I'm Afrikaans. In South Africa, we speak Afrikaans and, and many different languages. But anyway, which is Afrikaans for a wired fence, but those ones that one would use for a chicken coop. So it's small little round wires. And in South Africa, you call it an oogiesdraad. And oogies means eyes, small little eyes. And it's a wire. So direct translation, would, you would call it an eye wire. So this is important. And that's the end of the dream. So my daughter, I was speaking on a phone. I was in a Mediterranean city. I, was really, I had salmon color suit on with flowers. I was official. My daughter was taking a video of me and a bull came ranging and there was eye wire between her and she wasn't scared of the bull. This dream confirmed what father was showing me just before she messaged me. Because Athens is in Greece and I was in a Mediterranean city. Okay, then the salmon office suit I'm wearing speaks of going against the flow and being there on official business. Now, in my Spirit of Truth video, I, I talked about the fact that I told my husband that I'm a salmon, I go against the flow. And so, yes, yeah, she dreams of me having an, a salmon color suit on. Um, I've been sent with a message because I'm talking on the phone. I'm giving a message. The audio message is, in a sense, exactly what I'm doing now by 
speaking to you now it's an audio message right um i'm giving you a message that father is sending me and because he has used me as a sign to the church right he's using me as a sign what is what he's showing me in my own life what he's causing me to do is a message okay it's a prophetic message the suit had flowers on it for those who have not listened to the queen of the south devotional that's where this is a reference to because the flowers points you to the bees now you get the queen that's standing next to the king in, in Psalm 45. And she has virgins that follow her. The queen bee always have little bees following her. And that's where the flowers come in. Because it talks about the land of milk and honey. Right? So you get the honey. And so the bees, what are their responsibility? They are sent out to spread the gospel. Pollination. Okay. Um... Another example of this queen bee is Deborah, and Deborah's name means bee, and it means to sting. So she's the queen, she judges. Remember, the queen of the south will rise with the men of Nineveh in condemnation, the just generation, in judgment. She will judge, and this is what the apostles will do. They are a type and shadow of the queen. The apostles, the fivefold ministry, not just the apostles, the fivefold ministry will rise up. Those who are true, truly that, will rise up to judge, will speak judgment over and teach as well, right? That is what Deborah did. They came to her to, so that they could hear her judgment and receive her wisdom. Okay, And she was also involved in warfare, just like I spoke about, that there will be warfare involved in the church. So she is both, Deborah is both a woman who gives wisdom and who goes into war to judge. In other words, she represents the queen of the south and she doesn't represent the virgins. Okay, The virgins are the men of Nineveh that rise up with the queen of the south, the little bees with the queen bee. Um, so my daughter is an example of that little bee. Okay, She's one of my children. My daughter, which is the type and shadow in this dream of the children, or the worker bees he has given me, is focused on me. She's focusing on me with her camera or her cell phone. It goes from audio then to video, because I'm speaking to my friend's audio message, but my daughter is now seeing a video. Pointing to do, not just focus on what I say, but also what I do. Just like Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So she has to follow me with her cell phone. See, look at what Petra is doing. Look at what those are who are going to be your elders that are going to be put in over you to look after you as they flock. Look to them. Follow them. Follow their example as they follow Christ. Okay? But she loses focus. She focuses on the uh, bull. She sees the bull coming. Now the bull is, is angry and is hungry and he is after her. The bull is a type and shadow of the time that it will be in. The bull is a reference to the mark of the beast because the bull itself is a beast. But he is hungry. The bull represents two things. He represents Varka. Varka is uh, 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 the name for bull and it's a reference to the V. But it also represents the money system because he is hungry. And he's not just thin because he's hungry, he's thin because of the plague. There's sickness. So we've got the mark of the beast, um, which is, the focus is money. If you look at all the cities, all uh, the major cities in the world, with, their, with specific financial institutes, there is a massive, massive statue of, of a bull. Um, that's a reference to this bull, which is the mark of the beast. Okay, so this is showing a type and shadow during the seals period where the Antichrist will rise up, the mark of the beast, and they will go after the children of the Lord God. Okay, but what must she do? She must not lose focus. She must keep her focus on those whom he has sent to look after the church in the time to come. You understand why it's so important that we deal with envy and division within the church and having a humble spirit. Okay, let's see. 
and you know this is going to be a very serious <laughs> that's now an understatement of the year issue in the time to come because when your children or when your husband or your wife or whatever has not had food for 20 days 15 days or longer and somebody comes and says oh, don't you want to receive the mark or would you be willing to do deny christ for this now where we are at now we say we will say there's no ways that we will deny him but it's going to be a whole different ball game in the time to come so now we need to get our house in order because then it's going to be a different story then it's going to be a matter of survival and then the true church will stand up depends on which side of the coin you are on so as I was listening to uh, uh, what Simone's dream, what she was telling me and the interpretation Father was giving me, I went back again to uh, what Father was showing with Paul going to Athens and everything went through. And then it went over, I read uh, um, uh, uh, Acts 17 and it talks about Paul uh, going to Priscilla and Aquila and the, the time he spent there. And I thought to myself, you know, this is exactly what's going to happen because Yeshua told his disciples that they will go from house to house and that they must eat whatever is served unto them. And that they 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 mustn't oh they mustn't go from house to house, sorry. They, they will go to a house, they must eat there what they must eat, what's given to them, and they must stay there. They mustn't go from one house to another house, you know, get fat from one house to another house, you know, eat the people's food. But no, where you are sent, the house, the church, where you are sent, feed them and eat what they give you. They I, I've already prepared a place for you. So I was thinking about this, how the Lord will provide for those apostles that he will send out. And how he's already prepared a place for them. Many preppers don't know that they've actually already prepared a place for the apostles. So um, as I was thinking this, Simone sends me another voice message. And she said, oh, I forgot to tell you, I almost didn't mention, but I had another dream, a short dream. I dreamt that you came to my house with your daughter. Now remember who my daughter represents. In this case, she can almost represent, uh, I represent the type and shadow of Paul and Silas or Paul and Timothy or, you know, those kind of things. Those or Paul and Barnabas that working together because they are sent out two by two. So here I come to her house and she says, I just wanted you to get along with my family and my friends. And all I was concerned about was that my food, must, you must love the food that I give you. Just now, just after the Lord was talking to me about going from house to and how we will provide for them. She sends me this dream. And she says, I was going in and out of the house. Then I would go and then I would return. Then I would go and then return. But all she wanted to do is just serve me and look after me. And I was so blessed by that, just to know how he will provide for me in the time to come. That was just amazing to, to receive that. And this reminded me of a scripture in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 9 where Paul writes, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn that provides your food. Doth God take care for oxen? Please note, this is what I wrote here, An ox is one who is strong and is a laborer. Ox means both strong and first. Aleph is the the tip, uh, uh, pictograph of Aleph is an ox. So it means that which is first, that which is an authority over you, that which is strong in spirit. And he's saying to them, Paul was saying to them, the ox is worthy to receive something of his labor, of everything that is done for you, that you may be fed. You are supposed to look after us. Okay, so this will be part of the function of the bees, of the virgins of those who have already prepared to feed those that God will send to them, the Priscilla's and Aquilas. They are Priscilla's and Aquilas in a way. Now, the interesting thing about Priscilla and Aquilas, they are, they are an apostle type as well because they are also sent out. They didn't just stay at their homes and look after whoever came to them, but they were also sent out as we read in scripture, they also went with Paul. In fact, they went to Apollos and they taught Apollos, Apollos as, as well. 
Okay, so they taught as well. So um, let's go to 1 Corinthians 4.17 and it talks about Paul, how Paul talks about Timothy. Remember my daughter is now a type and shadow of Timothy. Verse 17, 1 Corinthians 4, 17. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you to remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. And they had house churches. Remember, going from house to house. I was, in my dream, told to move my office to another house. Okay. So, needless to say, that Father was saying to me that he will provide for me, that he will provide for the apostles the time to come. So, in Luke 10, it's that you can read in your own time, Luke 10, about the commission given where they are sent two by two, and they go from house to another house as the Lord God sends them, and they are provided for. Okay. So I spoke about the fact that Paul went to Acts, uh, uh, Paul went to Acts, Paul went to Athens um, in Acts 17 and that he reasoned there. And that reasoning with the Jews and the Greeks in the synagogue, it means to converse, discourse with one, argue and discuss, to dispute. Now remember, apostle means the number 12 and it means a rod or a staff to point, to judge and to teach. So this is exactly what Paul is doing as an apostle. He's doing it within the church. Okay. And remember I told you that the apostle is going to two, is, uh, the, the sending out is to two different areas, to the world and to the church. And it's within the world that the gospel is preached, but within the church there is disputing. Okay. They need to be set right. So this is warfare. And warfare is twofold. Warfare is casting out demons. That we read about in Ephesians 6 where we are told that we must put on our spiritual warfare armor. We must put it on. And it tells us that our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness in the air. That's talking about the spiritual dimension. That talks about that which happens uh, uh, in the spiritual dimension. But then there's warfare on ground level, okay? That is written in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 to 6. And that's the disputing and the reasoning within the synagogue. So you have the spiritual warfare that takes place in the spiritual dimension. And you have the spiritual warfare that takes place on the earthly dimension. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 to 6. Let's read that. Can actually say it, but it says that our wolf, uh, 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 our armor. Let me get the right wording. Uh, uh, our weapons of warfare is not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, for casting down vain imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Taking captive every thought and bringing it to the obedience of the word of God. And having fulfilled our own ob obedience to judge or condemn all disobedience. So if you look, in, look at casting down vain imaginations, bringing down strongholds um, and taking every thought captive. What dimension are you busy with? Are you busy with a spiritual dimension? Or are you busy with the thoughts and reasonings of man's mind? That's the ground level. Yes, certain things need to be bound in the spirit. But it's with reasoning that you cast down. It's with disputing. It's with talking about it. Speaking the truth in love. It's judging Dis judging in the sense of discernment, right? That's why they are sent to the different churches because of all the deception that takes place. They need to pull down those strongholds. They need to deal with those issues. Now, uh, an apostle and a prophet, these uh, fivefold ministries, right? They are pillars of the church. A pillar has, if this is a pillar, right? It has a roof and it has a foundation, it has to be able to handle spiritual dimensional attacks. 
and deal with spiritual warfare in those areas. But it also gets pressure from the bottom, that which is happening on ground level amongst the flock. They need to be able to handle both that which is spiritual and that which is earthly. The pressure is from above and below. Therefore, they need to be established. They need to be strong. They are as towers. Okay, that's why we need to pray for those who are in leadership. They deal with a lot more that you're not even aware of. Okay. So this is when we read about Acts 17. It talks that Paul, when he was there, it says that his spirit was moved. His spirit was stirred within him. Okay. So that spiritual, because he said, the word says that he saw that the whole city was given over to idolatry. So here comes Paul and he moves in and he sees ap with apostolic eyes. He sees what God sees. He's not just seeing it, but he's moved in his spirit by it. So much so that he goes into the synagogues and he talks and he reasons. He's moved by his spirit. And so God will move our spirit and he will cause us to see things the way he sees it. And it's only his seeing that is important, not ours. Because sometimes we can be doctrinally correct, but out of timing, out of his will, and not necessarily us that need to speak. So he's seeing now with God seeing, and he's moved by the Spirit. Moved. Abram was told to move. Paul here was told to move by the Spirit. He was moved in his Spirit. Okay? So all other seeing is not the right kind of seeing. And the Lord God wants us to be able to see the way he sees things. And for that to happen, he has to deal with us, the own filters of our own heart. Because out of the issues, all the issues of life flows out of our heart. So whatever you have not dealt with, that rebellion, that envy, that tradition, the law that you still hold on to, the, the unforgiveness, the bitterness, the fear of man. Those will cause you not to see as you ought to see and act out of the flesh. We need to deal with it. Um, see where I want to go with this. I have two friends that I've made recently that have blessed me immensely. Um, I praise him for the friends that he gave me. I really have quality friends. <laughs> um, and these are two friends that are involved in the forum that I used to be with. And their names is uh, uh, Bryce Rogers and Sandy. What's Sandy's surname? Is it Bleak? I can't remember Sandy's surname. Sorry, Sandy. Um, and they contacted me separately and I didn't know actually that they uh, uh, knew each other and they gave me permission to give me this, uh, to give this testimony of them. And I see them as a modern day Priscilla and Aquila. And um, they were in contact with each other for, uh, for a long uh, time and they never saw each other. They've never met personally. Um, but they were talking to each other about the Lord and, and those kind of things and um, and separately they were speaking to me and I didn't even know that they knew each other. And then one day Bryce got in contact with, contact with me and told me that the Lord, he had a dream that he was, uh, uh, you know, that him and, and Sandy were supposed to be together and he was very unsure about it and he didn't want to move out on his own thinking that he was now driven by his feelings. And, uh, and Sandy felt the same way. And they really, really did not want to do anything um, out of the will of God. Just because they felt a sense and attraction towards each other. And so uh, they asked me to pray with them. And when I prayed for them, the Lord showed me a vision. And the vision was straw. Straw that came together and were plaited together. And at the end of the straw, so it's these long straws and they were plaited together and at the end um, they were holding hands. It was it formed hands. So these were all straw that were holding hands. And you can just imagine how strong you can't easily break straw when you pull it, when you put tension on it, and these hands knitted together. 
and he showed me this and he brought uh, uh, Psalm 126 to mind, which says, those who sow with tears will reap with, come with sheaves of joy in the morning. And he was, and they are quite of age now. <laughs> I won't say how old they are. This is what makes it even more beautiful. They have come to, of age, so to speak. And the Lord showed me that they will have many children in the spirit. Um, sheaves of joy will come through their lives because they've never been married before. And he will give them his children. They will have children. And so they're getting married in June 5. Oh, I think it's not, not June 5, sorry. And they married, they're married. getting married in June, but I'm not sure when in June they're getting married. And just knowing this blessed me so much. I love them to bits. And um, just how Father has asked them to leave all behind to follow him. And how he, Bryce, is leaving everything behind. Um, to go and get his wife to go and marry her just like Yeshua is coming to get his wife and also a type and shadow, shadow of Priscilla and Aquila that the wife is there to minister to her husband and the husband uh, um, just how they are going out like Priscilla and Aquila um, to bring in the harvest and how he will use these Priscilla's and Aquila's and many others to look after those that are in the uh, 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 that are elders and, and uh, will be sent to them. And I have another couple that I'm very close to. Um, my name is Ivan and Chantal, and they are definitely a Priscilla and Aquila, and they have definitely prepared their place. Room number eight is mine. <laughs> um, and they will also be sent out as apostles. So um, it's just amazing. Now, um, Bryce had a dream not so long ago. And this was actually before I uh, became personally involved with um, Sandy and Bryce. And um, I want to read this dream that he had because it's very applicable to the time we are in. Um, and it's called, I called it Singing the Last Song. And I'm telling you this dream because this dream is for us to take note of of the time we are in. He was given this dream for us to understand that the Holy Spirit is telling us it's time to go. And the Father gave me a, a word and that word was called when I say go. And I will do a separate video where I put that word on um, that it can be separate because I believe that the words that I give towards the end of these teachings are often missed by people. So I'm going to do a separate video of that. But it is time to go. And this is the dream that he received. The scene was like a fade in and I was viewing from a portal that no one was aware of. It was in a church where a young black woman about mid-twenties was sitting in the pews looking very sad. There were a few others there, but they seemed to be quite happy. Just like Maya's dream, one girl said, you know, Maya was scared about this guy running after her, and her sister and everybody else were happy on the couch. So in the same way, he is seeing a sad girl, black girl, sitting in the church, being sad. I think there was a wedding being planned. The scene changes now and I'm on a small theatre stage around 25 feet wide, like you might see at a school. Two or maybe three others was with me. The girl I saw earlier and I think her grandmother was Della Reese in this dream. The third was either me or someone I seemed to be seeing through their eyes with. I felt like a spectator, much like Maya on the conveyor belt. I think this was something like a rehearsal for a funeral and a wedding. So it's a funeral and a wedding. So he doesn't know which one it is. There was an upright piano on the right side of the stage. The top was only about a foot above the keyboard. There was a painting of Jesus sitting on the top left side of the piano, roughly 15 by 20 uh, centimeters. It looked just like Akiana Kramarik's painting, except it was in black and white and included his body down to just above where his knees would be. He had a full-length, long sleeve tunic on. His hands were by his sides. The background was more like foggy clouds. And Della Reese was standing next to the piano where the painting was. 
She was dressed like she was ready to leave. She had on a hat, an overcoat, holding on thin gloves in her hand. On the left side was a large stand-up mic. The young girl was standing at the mic getting ready to sing. I, or whoever was looking through, played a short, sad opening for the song. I can't recall the words to the song, but I do remember it was about the pain of joy. The girl started singing the song a cappella. She only made it partway through the song before she was too emotionally broken to continue. I think she would have composed herself and continued on. But Della, looking at her and seeing how much she was hurting, said something like, That was beautiful, baby. Come on now. It's about time to go. She then turned towards the painting and said, I just need to finish this first. She reached in front of the Jesus painting and stood up on, on another that had been lying face down in front of her first. This one painting was smaller and in color, beautiful fall colors, a small house cottage in the country. The painting of the house was sort of a close perspective and takes up much of the scene. Lots of sky though. The sky was the color like a sunset. Reds, oranges, yellows and a little blue. It looks like leaves are falling in the sky everywhere. I can't see any trees though. The leaves seem bright. And Della picks up some paint and I think a very small brush or spatula and adds one more leaf. It's while she's doing this that I realize those aren't leaves. They are small burning objects coming from the sky, possibly meteors, average size of a, of a softball. I notice none have hit the house or ground yet. In real time, it would be less than a second before impact. As she finishes this last one, she says, There we go. All done. Time to go. And she let go of the painting. It falls face down like it was before she stood up. My first thought was, won't that smudge the fresh paint? I then noticed that the painting of Jesus was changed now. Now the only thing you could see was Jesus' right arm and hand coming out of the foggy clouds. I woke up then. This is the interpretation. I say to him, you are, as you say, a silent witness. The church that you, you see speaks of the church. The young black lady represents the bride, more specifically the Shulamite in the Song of Solomon, where it says in verse 5 in chapter 1, I am black but comely. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Remember of Yeshua talks about the greater than Solomon is here when he talks about the queen of the south. Look not upon me, because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard have I not kept. She is saying there is nothing beautiful about her, nothing that qualifies her. She is poor of spirit. She sees her true condition. This points to her awareness of not being worthy, she is humble, and that she is saved by grace. She is also aware of the times that the destruction is coming and this is why she is sad in the story or in your dream versus others being happy in the church. The stage scene is like you say a rehearsal, in a way preparation for a funeral and a wedding, much like the song played on the piano where you know it is about pain of joy. So there's this pain and joy, a wedding and a funeral. Many deaths. Two opposites, almost like the piano itself, black and white. For a funeral, you wear black. For a wedding, you wear white. This is also why you were not sure about whether it was for a funeral or wedding, because both were applicable. This dream is both about judgment and him coming to get his bride. The small stage versus the big stage speaks almost of a small production. Only a few take note. There were only a few people part of this production, which speaks of many are called, but few are chosen. Okay? We get chosen for a production. Dallaries represents the Holy Spirit, 
grey-haired lady speaking of wisdom. She also played in the TV series called Touched by an Angel as a messenger of God. So she too, having been a singer herself apart from acting. Right. So the black girl or bride singing is mourning the pain and sorrow that is to come. Singing her last song for, to this world before she is to go. It is bittersweet, therefore the song is about pain of joy. Wisdom, or the spirit, tells her basically that she does not need to finish it. You don't even need to finish your song. That's how fast we need to go. Telling us that there's not even time to left to finish the first song or the last song. It was one, however beautiful. Singing a cappella speaks of the loneliness of this journey. The solo or walking with him alone as Enoch did and was taken by the Lord. The painting the black of the, the black lady is finishing, basically putting the final touches to it, is a prophetic message. She is basically saying she just wants to say the final last few words. The painting is peaceful and beautiful. It reflects the calm before the storm or the peace. Even though the world is in chaos right now, it does not remotely compare with what is to come. Della or the spirit painting the fallen leaves that are fire coming down from heaven is saying that the destruction is on its way. As you did not see it hitting the ground as yet. In fact, it's so close that you sense it would take one second to reach the earth. The painting falling over speaks of the destruction itself. The coming down of this world or falling flat on its face, so to speak. Not having an effect on the wet paint speaks of inevitably an irreversible calamity and destruction. The larger painting of Yeshua on the piano in monotone or black and white speak of the dark and sad mood of a funeral and wedding spoken of before. The black and the black and white painting of Yeshua versus the colorful painting of the small house in the country, in other words. In fact, the black girl who is the bride is in identification with him. Darkness, sadness. She reflects his heart, and so should we. The end where you see his hands reaching out through the clouds is where he is calling her up. She will now see him face to face. Delores, the spirit, is saying to us, it is time to go. We always have to ask why he gives us a dream. There are always instructions or guidance. In this case, it would seem that the Spirit is saying to start singing your last song. Sing it with all your heart. Do what you need to do with all your heart. Because the Spirit is standing with coat and hat in hand saying, There we go. All done. It's time to go. I pray that you will hear what the Spirit is saying to you personally, to get your house in order, to deal with the issues that I've discussed in this video, and to understand that He is very close to coming to get His bride. Are you ready? Are you ready? Have you repented? Have you made right with those you need to make right? Are you prepared for what is to come? We can only be prepared to, to a certain degree because it's going to be much worse than we could ever imagine. But have you done that which you've already spoken to you about? Thank you for taking the time and watching this video. I know it's long, but it's important. Pray His richest blessing over you. Amen.